Um, I admit to you now, I'm really nervous because I like to have everything slick and presented and I've got all sorts of things falling apart. And the reason I've asked to do it straight after a break is that I've just refreshed this and it's sort of ticking away. It could fall over any minute. So we'll see how we go and we haven't got all the proper kit. But that's partly the reason for my talk and what I want to talk about. Because, as you know, we live in a world of fast change. The changes in technology are so fast that not only can the broadcasters not keep up, it w up with it, we can't either. And how does that bode for a community of people that say, actually, they've got to be ahead of the game because they're training tomorrow's vision engineers, creative people, cameramen, <coughs> video engineers, technologists, IP network people who are going to carry moving image. How does that stand if we hadn't got even kit of today, let alone tomorrow, with us? So it's a big, big challenge. And I think nothing came home to me more than the other day when I was up at Loughborough um, with Gary and uh, Gary Barker. And he said to me, he said, whoa, a mate of mine was at a car boot sale the other day, and he saw a Quantel paint box. Now, who, know, who, who knows what a Quantel paint box is? See, there's one or two people around here that know what they are. Now, when I was a young man, which is quite a long time ago, not that long ago, but quite a long time ago, and a young, keen BBC producer, we used to know we'd arrived on our production if you could actually just spin a picture around. And that was really cutting edge. That was, you could stand in the bar and say, hey, I'm really cool because I had an hour on the Quantel paint box. And you look at my titles, you see an E falls over off the end. Isn't it great? Have another beer. <laughs> that was really the cutting edge of our creativity and you were looking for the next BAFTA award. Uh, and you used to book it. And it was about 1,500 quid an hour. Although Mickey Mouse money, because it was BBC money, that used to slosh around within the system. But nevertheless, you were charged 1,500 pounds an hour. And it was bookable. So you had to go in at a special time to do your Quantel session. You could also use it for mending things. I do remember once when I had to mend a superstars. You'd never do this these days in the BBC, but in those days we did it. Uh, where we'd actually screwed up. We were, in those days, it was the early days of two isolated, having an isolated VT recorder. So you could have your main cut coverage on one and then you could cover the other head on of the person winning or whatever. Uh, except as we drove away from the swimming pool at High Wycombe, uh, we realized that both the channels had been recorded on the head on camera. <laughs> so we hadn't got any coverage. So what we did is we went back and swam it again but told them not to swim too fast. And then I had more than one hour on the Quantel just sorting it out, speeding it up, and I got them to come in in the same order, in the same time. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, these athletes who aren't used to swimming actually were quite pleased with it, and they bought me a beer. You'd never be allowed to do that these days. But what did uh, Quantel do? Well, the sort of things it did were these sort of things, and you were really proud that you could do such things. <clears throat> I mean, it's really tedious, isn't it? That's what a Quantel paint box used to do. Well, what have I done? Have I gone to a car boot sale and got a Quantel paint box? No. Uh, I have to say it wasn't me, but I got one of my chaps to just say, spend 10 minutes with PowerPoints and see what you can do with it whizzing images around. Now, that would be sophisticated manipulation of digital images uh, 15, 20 years ago. Nowadays, we've all got it on our laptops. How many of us know how to do it is another matter, and some of us know how to do it too much, which is another issue. <laughs> Why I really wanted to just come along and challenge you and think about it today is I had the wonderful experience of being in Beijing of one of, as one of the international broadcast quality controllers. And it was a fantastic experience in many ways. But there is one thing that I came away with both excited and challenged. And that was actually because from a television point of view, Beijing was about that. It was about 16 by 9, high definition, 5.1 sound. Fantastic. The only problem is many of you didn't actually see it like that. And there are some big problems with doing that. And, and we'll see those problems in a minute when I try and show you something. Because what the producers had to do in Beijing was they had to protect it. It's called protecting it to four by three. So what it means is you shoot the picture. So in the middle of the widescreen image, the important stuff happens. And there's a lot of waste around the edges. So if you're looking in widescreen, you say, that's not very good. It's beautiful images but I've got real high definition of that man picking his nose in the side of the frame. Because, of course, the people on standard definition don't see it, but in the wide angle. Now, what it's doing is it's challenging the very ways you cover, for instance, sport, which is one of my areas of interest. And people are beginning to say, look at the aspect ratio. 
why don't we cover tennis from the side? And you might think that's funny, but it's not actually, because one of my jobs is to try and balance out the international interests. And some people cover volleyball from the back, like tennis, some cover it from the side. And if you get the South Americans against the Europeans, you try and mix it up a bit, so both of them get what they want. So what my point is, it's going to undermine all of this new technology, whatever it is, is going to undermine the very presumptions we have of the way we do things. Another thing I would say is, I, 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 one night, the, the ladies' doubles was a fantastic thing. Tennis was one of my sports, and it went into the middle of the night. And uh, I went into the quality room, switched the lights down, turned the sound up, absolutely fantastic. The ball was hitting the canvas behind me. It was a wonderful experience. And I thought, how wonderful, no commentator. The only time I wanted a commentator was when there was a dodgy line call or something. I just wanted a bit of help and interpretation from an expert. Fantastic. So it changes all our presumptions. What's the role of a commentator anymore in a world like that? Well, I was saying very quickly, in our lifetime, we've gone from many things. Many of us remember, not many of us, some of us remember, 405, black and white. My early memories of going to my auntie's to watch Mr. Ed, the talking horse, on ITV. And in those days on ITV, you had to have a converter. Miles is nodding, so he was there. <laughs> you had to have a converter sitting on top of the television in order that you could pick up ITV. Then we moved up to 625, <coughs> color, more definition. Then we went to high definition, the, the standard that we're looking at now. And one of the things that Paul Fox said to me, I always remember a prophetic thing he said, is, is that the cost of production, the cost of change in production from black and white to standard definition is not nearly as much as the cost in production from going from standard definition to high definition. So you have to shoot a drama like a feature film now with its lighting, its costume. You can't have any old crud in the side of the set as you can. I don't know how many of you have seen television sets but they're pretty naff things. Well, you can't do that in high def because you see the bits of plaster and everything. And now, believe it or not, before we've even settled down that, people are talking about high ultra high definition. And only just a few months ago, the BBC put an ultra high definition picture across from London to the IBC in Amsterdam, uh, which was running at six, 7680 pixels, 4320 lines, and wait for it, 22.2 sound, and I saw the microphone they used for it, and it was like a sort of thing that had, it was like a mine, it got microphones going everywhere. Think of the cost, think of the production skills that go into that, but that's what they're looking at. But interesting, there's one thing they solved. I don't know if you know the, pic the size of the picture, the size of the data that was coming out to produce that, it was 24 gigs, which even challenges Janet a little bit, uh, or too much of it challenges Janet a little bit. Um, but they said, ah, we've got a problem, we realize that's, um, that's not really very good. And within a few weeks, they got it down to half a gig, transmitting that. Now, that's what people can do when they have to, have to and when they're being innovative. Let's just have a look at one more thing very quickly of change that's happened. Post-production. That's the sort of thing I started. When I did Superstars, we were working in a linear, a linear editing suite. And I remember when linear really meant something to me was on the raising of the Mary Rose when I was a junior assistant producer doing the edit for the nine o'clock highlights on BBC Two. And uh, I had seven minutes to go. And I, my heart even those days missed a beat because I realized I've got nine minutes to edit. Linear editing, you can't edit nine minutes in seven minutes. You have to do what they call a little flying join. So, and that's quite hairy, that makes you miss a beat as well. Non-linear editing and then came along and of course, it didn't matter so much. And suddenly, the transition has changed from a big suite, custom built, to a computer. And Miles has got stacks of them down at Ravensbourne, commodities that people use, unlike a specially engineered suite. And then what I would suggest is now we've got to a stage where anyone can do it. They can get the kit easily. My son, who is a medieval historian stroke theologian, he hates geeks, he hates media people, he can't stand any of us, but, He's keen on surfing, and he loves to go and shoot his stuff on surfing. He goes to a cheap editor on his computer. He, he lays a music track, and he cuts it together. And I have to say, I look at it, and I see a quality there that the BBC sent me on a course for a week to learn how to edit like. These kids are using it for communication, for sharing. They're not television producers. They don't even want to go near the business. But they're using it. Like this guy down at the bottom right, it's, it's a commodity product that's there, unlike the top left. Now, <clears throat> where's the big revolution that happened? A lot of my old chums in the old television are a bit envious of me because in my dotage, I seem to have found a quite interesting area. And they're quite envious 
about how television, how moving image is taking off on this thing called the internet. And we haven't got time here to go into what exactly IPTV is, but um, it's quite exciting. And one thing, it's not a closed loop, unlike television. Television, you had to have licenses and all sorts of things. This is anarchic. It's happening on the web, and it's going everywhere, wherever you can pick it up on the web. And that's the sort of take up that Gartner are predicting. Now, this is where the fun and games start. I'm going to try and do a little demo here for you. Now, my apologies, uh, because we haven't got a high-def projector. I did try and get one, but it was too expensive, and uh, I think that's part of the lessons we need to learn, that this stuff is expensive, and it's not readily available, so perhaps we have to find other ways of doing it. But let me just have a go. Now, this is a piece of high definition, if I can make it work, that's pulling down, it's streaming this stuff over the wireless that's in the room. So if too many of you are on Second Life at the moment, it might pull it over a bit. But nevertheless, you'll see in the bottom left the speed at which it's pulling it down. The pictures are not too good on here, so in the break, if you want to come and have a look at it on here, it's fantastic, I promise you. Uh, now let me see if I can get it to work. Um, well <laughs> have a little look at it on the screen because I promise you uh, you'll be amazed and I'm glad I was able to do that because I genuinely didn't want to plug it in on the wire that was coming on the wireless on the wireless that you've all logged into uh, which I think for you those of you in institutions and learning and teaching this is where it jams up my whole computer <laughs> um, looks like we're <laughs> oh well there you go that's fun and games isn't it I don't know if someone wants to try and unlock my computer while I carry on <laughs> Um, it would be nice to see if I can, if you want to have just, it, it does lock up and also. What I, what I wanted to really take out of that is uh, a couple of things I want to go to is just to have a look at what are the future opportunities that such things happen. There you go. If you can go to the future opportunities page, that'd be great. That's there. There you go. So very quickly, let's have a look at the opportunities that this sort of stuff might have. And let me reel off a few ideas. <coughs> If you go to presentation, Tim, that's what we do with this, with PowerPoint. <laughs> um, right. Well, what can we use for this? Uh, communications, communicating messages. Loughborough University, one of the leading institutions where the students do a lot of stuff. It's not, not about academics doing it. Loughborough University Students' Union, fantastic. And earlier in the year, in high definition, they did the, what's the real varsity match. Por apologies to any from, from Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, they did four and a half hours of ASLI broadcast with the women's rugby match and the men's rugby match, all covered on four to five cameras with presentation in studios. Fantastic. And that's students. Students doing it in their spare time. What a, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful opportunity. I was president of Wessex Films at Southampton. And I think we were given about 20 minutes of reversal, 16 mil, to use on a bow, let's say, age 16. Nowadays, these kids have got video, they've got sophisticated editing suites. What a great opportunity. Fantastic. But communication. And to the Vice Chancellor of Loughborough, if she gets three more world-class sports students who've seen the coverage of that game on the net, she's quids in. I mean, it, it's, that's what we're talking about. Specialized viewing, niche viewing. People go to it. They say, wow, Loughborough. I wouldn't say number one in sport because it might be someone from Bath or Leeds that says the other, but top sports university. I want to go there. Fantastic. Sharing. <coughs> I mentioned about my son sharing about his surfing with others. He's not, he's not into production or anything like that, but he's into a sophisticated sharing where he can show to his friends, look how good I am riding that wave. Uh, and people are using it for this. Teaching. <clears throat> One of the amazing things I saw in China, I popped down to the university where they run the network in China, and I saw an operation on high definition. Now, those of you, again, uh, it, it, it is a sign of getting old, isn't it? You hark back 
And you remember, some of us remember a program called Your Life in Their Hands. I think it was even black and white, wasn't it, David, originally? Uh, and what they used to say was, they said it was all right if you looked at the wound, but if you pulled out to a wider shot and you saw the patient's head, there was a big issue, and that's when people felt ill. Well, I can assure you <laughs> that in <laughs> high definition <laughs> surgery, I had to look away after a couple of minutes, because this the Chinese gentleman was showing me this stuff and how wonderful, and I thought, I can't take much more of this. <laughs> it was amazing, fantastic. So again, teaching and learning. Um, another one, Edinburgh University, with their manuscripts. Students can't go in and handle valuable manuscripts, but you can stick them on high definition, and you can see all the little indentations in the parchment when the monk was getting nervous because he was about to be stabbed in the back by a soldier, and they can teach you how that was, why that was happening. So amazing things that this new definition can bring that otherwise you wouldn't see. Research, those of you that have seen the research channel in the States, they've got high definition cameras down on the seabed outside Seattle. And, and that stuff is going all around the world, some of it coming across Janet, for researchers actually to use, not just to sit back and say, and it's lovely, to use, to collect re re data, to use for analysis. Um, so that they don't have to move out of this country. They can stay in their laboratories and use that information. Creating. Uh, what about all the, all the media students? All the people uh, and creative industries are an important part of this country's economy. What amazing opportunities this has. One of the challenges for us is how can we equip them up so they can do it. Someone said to me coming in this morning, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about the credit crunch. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether he's coming to the same meeting, but I will, say, I will say something about the credit crunch. When I was in the dot-com business, and we had our backs to the wall with cash flow, it didn't half make people become innovative. And if you want to be innovative in any game, this is the game to be innovative in. Maybe some people come to try and stop you. I'll come to that in one moment. And then innovation, how important for all of us to get outside our comfort zones. It's too easy to sit there. And I find in this community you get almost sheep and goats. You get some people who are quite comfortable. They see that nice pension coming up. They don't want to rock the boat, and they just cruise along nicely. And you get others who, up to the day of their retirement, are like tigers and ferrets. They want to do new things. They want to do interesting things. I would suggest that we need to be in that last category. So very quickly, um, <coughs> just some of the challenges that, that, that there may be. Money, clearly. Uh, money is one of the issues that you will come across. Maria's going to talk a little bit about shared services. Sharing is one of the solutions to it. It's one way that you do need to get together. So if it's a very expensive bit of kit, do these days you have to everyone have their own? There are interesting ways in which you can collaboratively um, put your hands on resources. And we have a big, powerful network. I have to put that plug in, but it's true. And that allows you to share kit. You don't have to be in the same place. So think about it. There are ways of mitigating that. Well, I had to put this in. There are old farts in the industry. There are old farts in our sector. Beware of them, because they're not driving forward progress. If we're trying to get kids to be innovative and to, to add to the, the country's economy, to be creative, we cannot have people who are stopping progress in our particular disciplines. Dismiss them, get rid of them, push them to one side, but don't let them stop you making progress. It's one of my passions, as you probably tell. It is going to take uh, more and more production resources. Um, it's going to, again, need to lead to innovation. At Luff Loughborough, I saw on the Real Vasty match, they actually made their own auto cue out of like a bedroom mirror. And it was fantastic. It really worked well. Uh, so, so think about it. All this stuff is going to require more and more. But I said to them, what about a crane? They want a crane. Well, Loughborough is one of the fine engineering universities. Get an engineer, get someone to do a project to make a crane. They were worried about health and safety. I said, well, build that into the project. That's part of the thing. It's got to be appropriate to go over people and be safe. Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, no, that's a good idea. So let's, let's, let's be innovative. Let's use the resources that we have in our community. And finally, we need leadership. <clears throat> One of the biggest gaps, I think, in the market at the moment, there is some tremendous talent in our community among the students for producing material. I still don't think we've got our act together in terms of providing leadership such that there might be a national student television network, a place where it, they can become more collaborative, more joined up outside their institutions. And I think that's a big gap in the market. We at Janet are not going to go into that area because it's not what we do. We certainly enable it and we enable that collaboration. But there is a big need, and I leave it with you, that there may be someone in this room who sees that's a vision that something they could take up uh, and go forward with. So finally, 
I would just say, don't forget these guys. That's who we're here for at the end of the day. We're not here to get the very best technology. We're not here for the sake of technology. We're not here to play with it. We're here to serve our students and make sure they have the very best. And uh, I encourage my senior team all the time. My finance director's uh, just been up to Scotland. And every time these people go out, they get excited when they've met real students. Because remember, we're a sort of head office operation. So I encourage them to go out and they come back excited, saying, now I really do, I know I think this is worthwhile, but now I really believe it's worthwhile because I've seen some of the people who benefit. Some of you people are right at the cold face and you see that every day. But let us never forget that those are the people we serve. And finally, Tim, if I may just do a little plug, uh, <coughs> for those of you that are really into the high def stuff and that piece of technology I showed you and want to see it in all its glory, uh, we do have an IPTV briefing on the 6th of November in Cambridge. And when I looked on the website last night, there were nine places remaining. Uh, and I'm not making money out of it or anything, but I do pass it on to you because some of you may well be interested in it. Thank you very much. <laughs>